something special for them in the dorm if they made me feel like special, you know. All right, again, my, my preaching paraphernalia all organized here. Well, good morning again. Happy Sabbath. Um, it's good to be here. It's a beautiful day, and uh, I'm thankful. And uh, man, that was an awesome song. Those kids were so cute. Um, I look at little Isaiah up there just dancing around, and I, something about him. I think his name's Isaiah. You know, that, that's what I'm drawn to because we have a son named Isaiah. He was, he's, our son's 24 years old. He's, he's, uh, he's beyond cute. He's a handsome young man now, right? But, but uh, yeah, so hey, I just I forgot to mention Pastor Dave uh, is not here, obviously. So um, he asked me to fill in this morning, and I'm happy to do that. Um, I am a person who is really into self-improvement, and I I think that uh, that's a good thing for all of us, especially if you need a lot of self-improvement, like myself, it's a good thing to be into, right? So that's what today's topic is going to be about. It's a common saying that uh, Ellen White said a lot in her writings. She said, by beholding, we become changed. By beholding, we become changed. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Whether you behold good or bad, you're going to become changed. Right? The influences and the, and the things that surround us do change us and mold us into uh, whatever that is. So we need to be purposeful in what we're beholding. Um, I want to share with you guys, uh, well, first of all, let, let me say this. Pastor Dave started, started a tradition here, and uh, we can't just stop it for a week. So I actually did come up with some children's questions. So if I can have a couple volunteers to come up with the microphones, we'll uh, see if these guys are still awake after that song. So a few questions for the young people out here. See if this works. And it does. Yay. Our first question. And uh, we're talking about change. So these questions have to do with people who have changed. So the first question. This apostle wrote 13 or 14 books in the New Testament. Um, We know he wrote 13, but there's one that is in slight question. We're pretty sure he wrote it, but not 100% sure. Um, And he spread Christianity to the Gentiles. He used to persecute Christians. He was changed into a Christian missionary after becoming blind and getting his eyesight back again. See if you know who that is. I see lots of excited hands. Um, Let's start over here. How about Sebastian? He looks like he's going to explode if we don't ask him. C. C? You think it's C? Okay. That might be. That might be. I don't know. Uh, Let's go down the end here. What's your name? Dylan. Dylan. We're going to ask Dylan. C. C? You think so? What do you think? Are they right? Yup. He says, yup. He didn't even need the mic for that. All right, let's see. It is. It is Saul. What was Saul's name after he was converted? Paul. Okay, I guess I could have, should have put Paul there, huh? Because that's what we really know him as. But Saul became Paul. He was changed. And not only was he changed, but God actually gave him a new name. He became Paul. Next question. He was the king of Babylon. He besieged Jerusalem and took Judah captive. He ate grass like an ox, and his hair grew like eagle's feathers. But after seven years, he changed and became a faithful man of God. He even wrote a chapter in the book of Daniel. Way in the back there. I can't see for the light who that is, but I see an excited hand back there. Nebuchadnezzar? (coughs) Good old Nebi, right? Nebuchadnezzar, you think that's right? Let's see. Anybody else want to confirm that right here? The white shirt. I can't remember your name. D. You think it's D, Nebuchadnezzar. So we have confirmation on that. Well, are they right? Let's see here. What do you think? How many people think it's D? Give me a thumbs up. All right. We think it's D. You're right. It is D, King Nebuchadnezzar. And he actually ended up writing and contributing to the Bible as one of its authors in one of the short chapters there. Last question. This is kind of an open-ended question. There's lots of right answers, but can you think of anyone who had their name changed in the Bible? Right here. Yeah. On the end. What's uh, Joseph? Joseph. Okay. And you had your hand up too. Jacob. Jacob. Okay. These are great answers. Right here. Back here. Give me the microphone. I don't know. I'm not good at names like Pastor Dave. I don't know the. Abraham. Abraham, excellent answer. In the back there, you guys are getting your exercise today. Mitch, way in the back corner. (laughs) Excuse me. Saul. 
Saul, yeah, that's the one we just had, right? Right over here. Sarah. Sarah, okay, good one. And then I think we had, was that Isaiah with his hand up over there? Shadrach. Oh, Shadrach? Yeah, yeah. I'll translate. Yep. Shadrach. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Aaron. Uh, Jacob. Jacob. Okay, there, there is a lot of right answers. One more here. Last one, and then we'll give a list. Mary of Magdalene. Who? Mary of Magdalene. Mary of Magdalene. I'm not sure if she had her name changed, but you know what? It says we're all going to get a new name when we get to heaven, so I guess you're right, no matter what. Okay, we see lots of hands in the back. Why don't you just shout it out real quick? Simon, okay, well, Simon Peter, I, you know, let's see here, gives us a long list, and wow, my, my tabs got off here when we, when we sent that over, but there's a long list, they're not necessarily in uh, sequential order, some of those names are flipped, but it was there, uh, some name switches there, some of those I didn't even know, but uh, interesting, so you can look those up on your own if you want, and confirm those. All right, we're going to talk today about change, Okay. Uh, change is a common thing. Um, it starts off early. We change our diapers, right? And then uh, if you live long enough, that might happen again. <laughs> change is one of those things that does happen in life. And uh, whether we like it or not, change is going to happen to you, okay? Um, I realize as I'm, I'm 48 years old now, and I, I grew up running, and uh, I used to be kind of fast. I was fast enough to get a scholarship to run in college, and um, I have this mentality that I still need to run fast. So when I go out and run, um, over the last 10 years, I've realized that when I run like I ran in college, I don't walk as well the next day. <laughs> and uh, so some changes have taken place. So I have to eat a piece of humble pie and slow down and run my age, right? So I don't run as fast as I used to. Um, but uh, I, made a, I, I made this up back in the when we had that pandemic, and I don't know if uh, there's any church members here, when we were writing those little daily devotionals, you remember we were sending those out to the, the congregation, and uh, I actually based this sermon on one of those devotionals that I wrote, and uh, change, a little acronym, C stands for choose, then hold fast, ask, navigate, give up, and engage, so we're going to go through each one of these points, and uh, hopefully we can walk away with some uh, better tools in our toolbox to be able to advocate for good positive change that helps us to be more like the Lord. So, first of all, you don't I necessarily have to read, I just put it on there for my sake, and it's, it's actually working. But this is uh, called an autobiography in five chapters. And uh, I'm going to just, uh, you know, Dennis, you shared your testimony last night, and um, I think from what you shared, it would be okay if I said that I think you could probably... Um, agree with some of the things that are said here. And I know anyone in this room who has struggled with things that they needed to overcome can look at this little, look, I guess this is a, an, um, an allegory type little thing here. But uh, let's read this, and you can apply whatever it is that you're struggling with into this little story. Autobiography in five chapters. Chapter one. I walk down the street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. Anyone ever been there? Anyone have that chapter one experience in life? I think we all have if we think deep enough. Chapter two, I walk down the same street. There was a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place. But it still isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. I think if we reflect deep enough, we can all agree that we've had some of these chapter two experiences as well. Let's move on to chapter three. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it is there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. Chapter four. Chapter four. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter 5, I walk down another street. Change is not easy, guys. Change is not easy, and it's hard sometimes to get out of that circle 
of those first three chapters. And then we move on to chapter four when we think we've got it all under control, but we keep exposing ourselves to the temptation, right? Okay, that's why the, the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, that they recommend that people who have struggled with alcohol probably shouldn't go hang out in the bar and drink orange juice, right? Because they're going to be surrounded by the temptation that led them to their fall. We need to eventually get to the maturity level where we can choose to walk down a different street, right? To walk down a different street. I'm going to shuffle through my pages here because I'm pretty sure I had a Bible text that went along with that. But I don't think I wrote it on there. Walking down that different street. Um, we can just use this Bible text, one we commonly know. Um, we're not doing brain surgery here. These are a lot of simple little things that we've heard before. But Psalms 119, 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The path that we choose to take, I hope, will be the path of the light that God shines before us. Right? He holds us accountable for that light which he gives us, correct? Some of us receive a lot of light, some of us receives a little light, but we're all going to be judged based on that light, okay? So, and the key word is there, God judges us, not us, right? If you're not walking in the same light I'm walking in, I'm not, it's my, not my job to judge you. It's my job to walk in my light, amen? All right, let's move on to the next one here. Hold fast. Those are cute little monkeys. I thought I'd put those on there. Hold fast. What are we holding on to? And my words got all mixed up here. It looked different on the computer, but that's okay. You know, I'm te technology and me are like this. The only thing is, this is me over here. It's a, <laughs> there's a little bit of a disconnect there, but that's okay. We're doing our best. Um, so the bold words go together and the, the non-bold words go together. What are we holding on to? Okay. Um, uh, I don't even know what I wrote there. <laughs> I did make a copy of these so I can look and see what it's actually supposed to say here. Because I knew something like this was going to happen. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, Hebrews 10.23. And that's not even on there. That's weird. Uh, uh, encourages us to hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering. This reminds me of a story that I heard from Doug Batchelor in a sermon one time about these monkeys. You probably heard this story before, but it's a, it's a great little story that teaches us a good lesson. These monkeys were on this little island somewhere, I don't know where, somewhere in the world, but they have monkeys, not in Arizona, we don't have monkeys here. And uh, these people would hunt these monkeys, and their job of hunting these monkeys was made pretty easily in the fact that they would put these little gourds with a small opening, just big enough for the monkey's hand to get inside. And they would squeeze a piece of fruit down there, and the monkeys would go down, and they would, these gourds would be chained to the ground so they could only move so far. And the monkey would reach down in there, and grab onto that piece of fruit that they wanted so badly, and then when they tried to pull the piece of fruit out, because the hole was just big enough for their hand, when they had the fruit in their hand, they couldn't get it out. And the monkeys were so stubborn, and they would hold on to that thing that they desired so passionately to get, that the hunters would literally come down the little hammer and just right on the top of the head and take them home and grill them up and have monkey stew. It sounds pretty good. No, I'm just kidding. We don't eat monkeys around here. Potluck today, right? Yeah. Um, they would eat these, these monkeys, but that, that's a pretty easy job. They didn't have to go out and, you know, hunt them down or anything. They just knew that these monkeys were stubborn enough to hold on, even at the expense of their, their doom, right? Okay? They, they see these hunters coming, and they're panicking, but they're, they're trying to get out, but they can't because they're not letting go. They're holding fast to something that's going to destroy them in the end. What are you holding fast to? There are so many distractions in this life that we hold fast to. Maybe it's your car. Maybe it's a, a toxic relationship. Maybe it's social media. We all have our little vices, you know, whatever it is that we're struggling with, and we want to hold on to those, and we make excuses, and we... We twist and bend and manipulate and do all these linguistic gymnastics to make God's word fit whatever our vice is so that we feel better about our miserable state. Am I the only one who's experienced this? 
This is a pretty common thing. What are we holding fast to? Hebrews 10, 23. Hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering. Without wavering. Don't waver to the left. Don't waver to the right. But stick to what it is that we're supposed to be holding on to. All right. Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it will be given to you. We need to be humble enough to ask. There's something about the mentality of most long-distance runners. I'm a long-distance runner. <coughs> and there's this thing where we, we have it in our mindset that we, we like to work hard and we like to do it on our own. It's a lonely sport, okay? It's not a team sport. You rely on yourself. You go out and you run for hours where it's just you and the pitter-patter of your feet and the rain and the snow and the sleet and the heat and the cold in the early dark hours. Man, I can remember when I first started teaching, I'd get up at 4.30 in the morning in order to get my 12-mile run in before I started teaching all day long. And my wife would say, why do you run so much? You're not even, like, racing that much anymore. I was like, I don't know. It's just, it's just what I do. But this mindset of, I can do it myself, it got, it's gotten me in trouble many a time. When I first started teaching in the Seventh-day Adventist school, um, I, I started off teaching in the juvenile detention center, which I learned a lot of good, hard lessons there. And then I went into the public school, and I learned a lot of good, hard lessons there. And then I went into the Seventh-day Adventist school, and guess what? I learned a lot of good, hard lessons there, too. And the interesting thing is that uh, when I got there, I had, had this mindset that I can do it all on my own. I wasn't qualified for the job that I got. I had never taught upper elementary before. And when I got there, I realized this wasn't like teaching in the public school. You know, you got groups of kids. I was teaching middle school in the public school. And, you know, you teach periods, you know, so you get a new group of kids every 40 minutes or so. And all of a sudden, I'm teaching 7th and 8th graders. I got almost 30 kids in the classroom, and I had to teach two maths, two language arts, two sh social studies, two sciences. And they didn't let me know this beforehand, but I had to do music. I had to do art. I had to do PE. I had kids in my class before while I was trying to get ready for the day. And usually by 4.35 o'clock, when the last parent got off work and got their kid off, then I was kid-free. Elementary teachers, I love you. I don't know how. That's, yeah. Amen. They need a standing ovation. Um, high school teaching is so much easier. No, it still has its difficulties, too. They're like, no. We, everybody has their skill set. But I'll tell you what, when I got there, people knew that it, I was new, and they said, hey, can I help you with this? There's this old guy who teaches math. Maybe he could help you teach some of your upper grade math. Hey, we got this lady who can do this for you. Um, I'm willing to take this class for you. Nope, I got it, I got it, I got it. And guess what? I fell flat on my face because I wasn't willing to ask for help. And I reaped what I sowed. And that was one tough year of teaching. Don't be so stubborn and hard-hearted and puffed up that you think you can handle it all, okay? You guys heard that expression, God only gives you what you can handle, okay? Well, that's not really biblical, okay? God will tempt you, or God doesn't tempt us. God will allow temptations to come, but he will always give you a way out. But there's a difference between temptation and just dish, the things that this world dishes out that we can't handle. If we could handle everything that we experienced in life, then guess who we wouldn't need? Think about that. God sometimes allows things to happen where we fall flat on our face because the only way to look up, the only way to look when you're down at the bottom is up, right? And if we keep our eyes fixed horizontally, we're going to fall flat on our face. He wants us to, to seek things vertically, and that is him. So don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to ask. The next one is navigate. Okay, we're moving through this world at a fast pace, right? Um, literally, like this world is spinning, it's, it's orbiting in the sun, it's, it's, it's twirling on its axis, and we're driving down, you know, speed limits 50, and we're doing 80 to make it to work on time, just to keep up with traffic. I mean, this is a fast-paced world. We're navigating through the myriad of obstacles and, and temptations and, and stumbling blocks that the world has to dish out, right? As we navigate through all these things, we better have a good GPS, and, okay, I'm just old enough to where we were kind of transiting, you know, when I was starting to drive and stuff, we used to have to use one of those things called a Rand and the Nally Atlas, right? You know, this is kind of weird. My son, actually, as a little kid, grew up, and for his birthday, he wanted a Rand and Nally Atlas. He loved to study maps. 
this four-year-old kid. We'd go on road trips. We'd drive from Flagstaff to Logan Sport, Indiana, where, where our parents live, and uh, almost 30 hours of driving. And we'd, my son would be sitting in the back seat in his car seat with a random McNally Atlas, and he told us where to go. We never got lost. He'd be like, oh, there's an exit up here in so many miles. We're like, how do you know that from looking? Like, oh, these little numbers there between, the, that tells you? And, and I, I didn't know, like, the exit signs actually represent miles. And the, he knew all this stuff when he was, like, four years old. Okay, he's in med school now. Um, I don't know, he must skip generations, the intelligence thing or something. He probably got it from my wife. That's what it is. But a super sharp kid. But that was back in the days when we had to navigate by paper maps, right? Now you just punch it in your phone and you hope the GPS tells you what to do. And there, there's been times in my life when I'm not going to lie. I'm horrible at directions, by the way. There's been times in my life when it's like, oh, I punch it in the GPS, but I'm pretty sure I kind of know where I'm going, and the GPS is telling me to go one way, and I'm thinking in my mind, that doesn't seem right. I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to be going this way, so I'll take off in the direction that I think I'm supposed to be going, only to kick myself and gripe and moan as I get back to what the GPS told me to do, and I ended up arriving at the, you know, the destination. Um, I trust myself sometimes when I shouldn't. The point being is that God gave us this little set of books called the B-I-B-L-E, right? Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth, the Bible, and that is our navigational system that gets us from point A to point B, right? If we're not using that, and if that's not a, a lamp into our feet and a light into our path, then we're going to arrive at the wrong place. Um, the little quote here, um, <laughs> the wise old farmer, for every mile of road, there are two miles of ditch, right? You got a ditch on either side of the road. No matter if you go to the left or to the right, if you're not on the road you're supposed to be on, you're going to find yourself up the creek without a paddle, like I've been many times. I'm ashamed, I'm ashamed to admit it. But Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, narrow should say, is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life. The road's not easy. Sometimes the road is like that road that your parents tell you about when they walked to school back in the day, you know, barefoot, uphill, headwind in the snow, you know, both ways. I don't know how that works. But life isn't easy, and the road is difficult, okay? God says, pick up your cross and follow me. He doesn't say, invite me into your life, and then you, everything's going to be smooth, okay? Life dishes its challenges out, whether you're a Christian or not, but I'll tell you what, if you have a good navigational system, it'll help you navigate through the myriad of obstacles and obstructions and deterrence and all these things a whole heck of a lot better. And when you arrive on the other side, you're going to be a lot better off. So navigate. This also reminds me of a, a, a little story about the uh, navigational system. I, I heard this in a sermon once too. I thought I'd share it with you. Um, if you left um, an airport on the East Coast and you're flying to, say, L.A. or something like that, and if the coordinates was off just by, like, one degree, by the time you reached where you were supposed to be, you'd be, like, 50 miles or so off course, okay? You have to fact-check the numbers there, but you're going to go from, you know, the first few miles, you're thinking, oh, I'm going in the right direction, right? Pretty much heading in the right direction. I'm going west, right? But just one degree off in the beginning can land you somewhere not even in the ballpark, Think about that for a minute. When you think about that and apply that to the principles of life, young people, I'm telling you, you, you make some decisions now that greatly affect your trajectory toward your future and you don't even realize it. Okay, there are so many temptations in the world. Oh yeah, you know, everybody's doing it. It's not that big a deal. You know, Joey over here, he's doing it and he's, he has straight A's, you know, so it can't be too bad. Or, you know, Susie over here, she's, she's doing it and, you know, she's, she's, all the teachers love her and she teaches and uh, Sabbath school, and she's doing all these things, and she's such a great person, and she's doing this bad thing. So it's just, it's, it may be a little off, but, you know, it's going to be okay. But you know what? In the long run, those things lead to destruction. Why does the gate, why does the gate? Every mile of road, two mile of ditch. Stick to the straight and narrow. Let God's word be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Give up. Give up. All right, let's pray. No, I'm just kidding. If we left there, you'd be like, what in the world is that supposed to mean? Well, that's supposed to be a picture of me trying to get buff. Keyword there is trying. 
Um, as an endurance athlete, I've realized that my body type doesn't accommodate getting large muscles. Um, and I realized that. And uh, I, I, I do lift weights to prevent the atrophy that usually happens after, you know, you get old and testosterone levels decrease. And, um, you know, trying to maintain the little I have. But I'll tell you what, I learned something. I learned something. I was hit in the weight room. And I was, I, I'm, a, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm not trying to brag or anything. But I'm a very hard physical person. Um, I love physicality. I like to do hard things, okay? If somebody said, hey, we're going to run 20 miles and we're going to end at the top of that mountain over there, I'm like, sign me up. I'll do it right now. Let's go. I, I, I love doing that kind of stuff, okay? I'm not very good at a lot of it, but I love doing it. And uh, I remember hitting the weight room, and I was like months and months of hitting the weight room, and everybody said, man, you've been lifting weights a lot. But it doesn't look like it. I'm like, well, thanks a lot, you know. I mean, I feel a little bit stronger, but I just, you know, I don't have, like, where's Mason? Can I pick on you, Mason? Mr. Rogers' son over here. Mason started lifting this last summer, and can I, can I pick on you? you? You won't be embarrassed. You've put on what, maybe 15, 20 pounds-ish? He's put on some weight, um, not fat, pure muscle. He went, you went from, you started benching, and you were doing what, like 115 or so reps? somewhere around in there, and now he just, right before Christmas break, he, he pushed up 225 pounds on the bench press. He's a strong kid. I can't do that. Sorry, mate. Yeah, again, that's good. It's hard work, dedication. And he's worked hard at it. Yeah. And I, I can attest for it because I see him, and he does train on a very regular basis, and he's systematic about it. And it, it, it tells you when you set a goal and work for it, you can achieve it. But what I was doing is I was working really, really, really hard and I wasn't allowing myself to recover. What I needed to do was kind of just give up my pride and allow my body to recover. And uh, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Um, God wants to be that strength for us. Um, I'm never going to be able to bench press 225 pounds. It's just not my body. I, I'm just not a strong guy like that. But I'll tell you what, God can use even the weak to do amazing things at his time and for his purpose. And I want you to remember that, to give up on relying on yourself and put that trust in God. The next one is engage. This is the last one. We're going to end with this one today, and I'll share a few things with you to close. Engage. What do we engage with? Okay, when a, a couple gets engaged, that means that they're going to unite, right? They're going to spend time together. They're invested in each other. They're interested in each other. They're committed to each other. Ephesians 5, 16 and 17 says, Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What is God's will for your life? I know what his ultimate will is, and that is for you to be in his kingdom one day and to participate in the amazing adventures he has in store for each one of us in the hereafter. But in the meantime, we have to apply some of these principles that we've been talking about today and choose to change in the right way so that we can become more and more like Jesus so that when he comes again, he can look at you, Pastor Jean, and can say, I see my reflection in you. Well done, my good and faithful servant, right? He wants that for each one of us. And I put on here just that little picture of some of the distractions that are very, very common in today's day and age and uh, with social media and various different things like that. And I'm not going to knock social media. I check my Facebook and Instagram. And I'm going to be honest with you, I, I probably spend too much time on those things. Okay, and I'm, I'm guessing I'm not alone. It's fun to see what other people are doing. But as I'm filtering through all the reels and the various different things that, that pop up, maybe one out of every 10 is something that actually applies to me. And the other 90% is... Are, are things that distract me, that pull me down rabbit holes. And before you know it, I'm watching um, videos of, you know, 
I don't even know what to say because I can't think of anything appropriate, if you know what I'm talking about. These things are traps. The devil wants us to be so engaged and so occupied with the world that we push God aside, right? How many people have ever been sat down and maybe you do your devotional on your phone? You thought, oh, I'm just going to look at um, Instagram just real quick before I pull my devotional up. A half an hour later, you get up and you go into the kitchen and you're like, oh, shoot, I forgot to do my devotional. I'm seeing some heads nodding. Okay, my head's nodding too. I've been there. I'm not immune from this. I'm not like going to be like, hey, I never do that to you sinners. You know, how dare you? We all wrestle with these things. And maybe that's not your distraction. Maybe your distraction is something else. But I'm going to be honest with you. Whatever it is, we got to sometimes just smack ourselves in the face, throw some cold water down, and just be like, okay, let's refocus, let's recalibrate, and let's get back on track. Okay, so what you engage in and what you engage with and what you invest in is huge as far as you staying on that narrow road. Um, we're going to close uh, with, with just a couple of thoughts here. This is something that I told you I was into, like, self-improvement and stuff like that. And um, I came across, I wasn't even planning on sharing this, but I found this in my, uh, in my classroom, just buried under a bunch of folders. I've had this particular green folder. Bambi, I don't know if you recognize this or not, but this has been drug around for all my life. I started keeping this when I was in high school, and um, I have quotes. There's even a, the back of a, cer uh, this is a generic Raisin Bran cereal box. I cut it out because it had a lot of really good quotes on it. And on that particular day, I was too lazy to write them out. Um, but I think I was eating that generic Raisin Bran probably my junior or senior year in high school. And there are quotes from Albert Schweitzer, Mark Twain, uh, Sojourner Truth, Eleanor Roosevelt, you know, just all these motivational, inspirational words of wisdom from people who have walked the road before me. And I started keeping these back then. And uh, this one in particular has some of my favorite quotes, and I want to share these with you. And you might be thinking, well, Mark, come on, you should, we should be digging into the Bible. Well, I think another thing we need to do is surround ourselves with a circle of influence that moves us in the right direction. And we can glean truths from other people, uh, even outside of the Bible. The Bible is what we use to fact check, right? The Bible is the foundation from which all our major decisions and, and the trajectory of our life should be based from. But it doesn't mean we can't glean wisdom from other sources. And I just wanted to share a few of these things and encourage you to try to glean good from everything you can and put those into your life. Well, these are some of the quotes. Uh, one, believe it or not, is actually from Oprah Winfrey. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> Some of you are like, oh, cancel culture. Oprah, she's, she's no good. We're not good. I think these are wise words. She says, the harder you work, the easier it is to work hard. The harder you work, the easier it is to work hard. You accommodate to the workload that is set before you. So much truth in that. Henry David Thoreau, in the long run, men only hit what they aim at. Good stuff. I like this one from Juma Ikanga, who's a, a, a runner from East Africa, and he says, the will to win means nothing without the will to prepare. Ooh, good stuff. Wise words. Wise words. I like this one from Ernest Hemingway. There is nothing noble in being superior to your fellow man. True nobility is being superior to your previous self. Words of wisdom. I, I'm, I'm not kidding. I collected these when I was in high school. Um, and I just saw so much value in some of these little quotes. Um, this is one from Leo Buscaglia. I don't know who this guy is, but I think these are wise words. Your talent is God's gift to you. What you do with it is your gift back to God. We'll close on that thought. I hope some of these words will be such that will motivate you guys to to seek God's word, to allow the B-I-B-L-E to navigate you through this crazy world that we live in so that you can navigate through the obstacles and end on that sea of glass in God's kingdom one day. Let's bow our heads. Father, we love you. We know you love us more. But Lord, I just pray that the talents that you've given us, that we can return those and capitalize on those and use them to bless others. And that uh, the rewards that we can reap from those will be an increase in your kingdom. 
and to point people to you and the cross and all the blessings that you have for us. And Lord, I just pray that as we leave here today, um, we will be a little bit better acquainted with your will for our lives and a little bit more filled with your Holy Spirit. No, Lord, filled to overflowing with your Holy Spirit so that we can overflow into others and draw them to the cross. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.